and gentlemen, my name is Radhika and I'm a research intern at Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. I am pleased to welcome you all to this week's edition of ICS Wednesday seminar titled The Sino-Indian Border Simmers from a Decade of Confrontation. Over the course of the past decade, India's military has encountered a heightened state of confrontation with People's Liberation Army along their extensive border. This aggressive phase began in 2013 at the Dalitbagh Old Sector and since witnessed various instances of territorial disputes. Notably, the recent standoff in Ladakh has unveiled a new dimension in the management of Sino-Indian border marked by the People's Liberation Army intrusions into six areas in eastern Ladakh. This has disrupted the previously established peace supported by five border agreements and has raised pertinent questions regarding the nature of this decade of uncertain peace. This talk seeks to critically examine the multifaceted issues arising from the ongoing tensions, shedding lights on several key inquiries, dwelling into the rationale behind China's focus on Ladakh instead of Arunachal Pradesh, evaluating the sustainability of the present state of affairs under, under India's pursuit of status quo, and drawing insights from the past three years of negotiations negotiations with China are essentially towards understanding the implications for future prospect. Moreover, it is imperative to assess the potential ramifications of the prevailing situations, contemplating whether there is a regressive trajectory mirroring the conditions of 1959 rather than a progressive, a tangible progress towards peace. As this exploration unfolds, it becomes increasingly apparent that India must adopt a cautious approach, refraining from complacency and carefully considering its strategic course ahead. Joining us today to discuss this topic is Colonel Ajay Shukla, who is a renowned specialist in defense and strategic affairs, international relations, and the defense economy. He primarily writes for the National Daily, Business Standard, and his articles also appear in international publications such as the New York Times, Guardian, BBC, and Al Jazeera. With over two decades of experience as a combat soldier in the Indian Army where he commanded a tank regiment, he brings a unique perspective to his writing. It is my great honor to welcome you, sir. I am also honored to welcome the Chair, Professor Alka Acharya, Honorary Director at Institute of Chinese Studies and Chairperson for the Center for East Asian Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Acharya has made a significant contribution to the field through her work as a joint editor of the book, Crossing a Bridge of Dreams, 50 Years of India-China, and as an author of the book, China and India, Politics of Incremental Engagement, published in 2008. She has also recently edited a volume titled Boundaries and Borderlands, a Century After the 1914 Shimla Convention. It is my honor to welcome you, ma'am. Before I invite the chair to begin with the proceedings, I'd like to lay out a few housekeeping rules. All participants are requested to be on mute throughout the session. Participants are requested to use the chat box to ask questions. Alternatively, you could use the raise hand options during the Q&A session. You will be called upon to unmute yourself by the chair and to do so, please mention your full name and affiliation along with your questions in the chat box. Now, I would like to hand over to the chair to take over and carry on with the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, so thanks Radhika, thanks for that. Uh introduction to the Wednesday seminar today. Um, in fact, the uh, abstract uh, is almost like uh, summing up what we were going to hear about today, except that, of course, uh, we hope to grapple with some more knotty issues out here. Uh, the reason uh, I looked to Ajay to come and uh, give us uh, kind of uh, backward and forward looking uh, assessment after three years uh, since the Galvan episode happened is because he is one of really one of the people whom I've not only known for quite a long time but read with uh, a great deal of uh, interest and instruction. I, I find his writings very incisive and uh, uh, one that is not afraid to uh, call a spade a spade. I think uh, it is necessary for us to take a real 
clear and hard look at where we are now three years since Galvan. And uh, it appears that once again, we seem to be at an impasse which is somehow different. And why is it different this time is something that I would like to uh, start off with. Uh, the kind of writings that have appeared over the last three years, uh, the kind of changes that have taken place, not just in India-China relations, but in larger regional and global dynamics, all are somehow uh, getting, uh, getting uh, their own kind of influence on the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, whether we take the larger uh, problem that is now facing the world um, since the Ukraine war or the Sino-American tensions uh, or the other regional dynamics, all of them are really uh, bringing a new set of challenges to India and China, even as they are discussing how to deal with the border. And if we look at the writings within the country on this issue, we see again a range which is... Uh, uh, not quite surprising in the hardline kind of positions that are quite emerging, but a sense that possibly the last 30 years of engagement, of discussions, of agreements, of mechanisms, um, nothing seems to be working uh, to help us tide over this particular patch. Uh, what is different? The obvious one is obviously that after three decades, we had casualties. And yet, uh, that is not just the whole answer. So I think what we need to do is once again, briefly look very clearly at what happened three years ago. And then, uh, uh, then, then we need to see why is it different? And therefore, how do we get past this, if at all? And on all this, as I said earlier, I know nobody better than Ajay to, uh, to take us through this. So over to you, Ajay. Uh, thank you very much, Alka. Thank you for that most gratifying and wholly undeserved uh, praise. But uh, it's it's uh, something that we really do need to do, uh, and that is to sort of revisit this issue. Uh, it tends to fade out from public memory, uh, you know, over a period of time. Uh, but it sort of gives rise to so many important factors and points that we really should. Uh, give it adequate attention. So we'll start from April 2020, April, May 2020, when for the first time since the Kargil intrusions of 1999, significant chunks of Indian territory were in the hands of foreign soldiers. Now that's something that jerk, jerk, should jerk us back uh, and uh, make us think. Uh, starting in the first week of May, uh, some 5,000 to 10,000 Chinese soldiers of the People's Liberation Army intruded into five points in Ladakh. One was along the Galwan River Valley. A second uh, was in Nakula in Sikkim. Uh, a third on the north bank of the Pangongso Lake. A fourth near Gogra and Hot Springs. And a fifth near PP-15. PP is patrolling points. Uh, in addition, there were two more intrusion points of lesser magnitude. Uh, one was uh, in Chumar, in uh, southern Ladakh, and a seventh, which uh, I should not call this lesser magnitude because this was the largest uh, intrusion of all. Uh, this was in the Depsang Plain at the northernmost tip of India where Dolak Bay Goldie is based. Uh, now, patrol intrusions from both sides are common in areas where the line of actual control and the McMahon line, uh, which is the de facto border between India and China, uh, are disputed. However, the events of 2020 were completely unusual. Uh, in sending hundreds of PLA troops three to four kilometers into the Galwan Valley, China was violating its own claim line and occupying territory that Beijing itself has traditionally acknowledged to be Indian. So this was clearly not shaping up like a routine patrol confrontation or a temporary occupation of uh, disputed territory. Uh, uh, these were uh, sort of uh, uh, small incidents that had taken place in Depsang in 2013 or in Chumar or 2014. 
But this time, the PLA had come into areas that they had never entered before. Uh, the second thing is they had come in very large numbers, in some places in the hundreds and thousands. Uh, the third other point that uh, we noted was that they were prepared to stay. They were digging defenses, preparing bunkers, moving in heavy vehicles, reportedly even moved artillery guns to the rear, albeit in their own territory, to provide fire support to the intruders. The other different point difference was they were acting in an extremely aggressive manner not hesitating to cause casualties on Indian troops. There were 72 troops who were injured uh, in uh, uh, the Pangongso area. 20 Indian soldiers were killed in Galwan. The prisoners who were taken by the Chinese were mistreated awfully. Their legs were smashed, their kneecaps were smashed. Uh, it, was, it was a sort of no holds barred uh, kind of treatment. Uh, and, uh, you know, a large number of these soldiers were flown to hospitals in Leh, Chandigarh, uh, and Delhi. Now, this unusual level of Chinese aggression was illustrated by an incident at the end of April when two Chinese helicopters, this is a bit like James Bond, two Chinese helicopters chased an Indian helicopter in which the Leh Corps commander was surveying Indian positions near the Pangong Lake. So they were swerving and uh, sort of being followed uh, over the lake. And it, it is just uh, good luck that uh, prevented any crashes or, or sort of fatal uh, incidents. So the PLA intrusions are not a localized operation. They were spread across the area of responsibility of different PLA brigades and divisions, uh, different Indian brigades and divisions as well. And that suggests centralized coordination from at least the PLA's theater command. Now, the official response of the Indian side, what was it? Senior officers in the Army's Public Information Directorate declined flatly to comment. There was a total silence from the uh, powers that be. The Prime Minister's office, the PMO, and the National Security Advisor, Ajit Doval, took personal charge of public handling and of overseeing the Indian response. Uh, India was frankly taken by surprise and for several weeks did not challenge or confront the narrative that was being put out. The Modi government took the stance that it had, lost, it had not lost any territory to the Chinese. And ironically, in doing so, the government found a government of India found itself on the same side as the Chinese PR machinery, which was giving the same argument. China has not occupied any Indian territory. So what was the issue then? Why was there so much concern about uh, occupying Indian territory when both the governments are saying that this never happened? Uh, let's go on from here and we try and make sense of that as well. Uh, along the 800 kilometer LAC in Ladakh, there have, there have traditionally been just five trouble spots where the two sides dispute where the line of actual control runs. Now, these five spots are Chumar, Demchok, Pangong, and two places near Dolipe Goldi. So the PLA is ingress into the Galwan River Valley, which was never in these disputed areas, opens up a new and worrying chapter. Now, it is also worth noting that when this happened, there was a new army chief who had taken command, General M. M. Narabane, and new operational emphasis. All through the Ladakh border crisis, there was, and I'm not going to hold back anything at all. Uh, it, if it doesn't sound nice, then that's the way it was. Uh, there was discernible tension between the first chief of defense staff, General Bipin Rawat, and his successor as Army Chief General M. M. Naravani. Uh, in the lead up to Army Day 2020, uh, that was when General Manoj Naravani had taken over command on 31st December 2019. Uh, and he appeared to be prepared to take a more independent stance uh, than his predecessor. Uh, the first thing that he said in his speech while taking over he publicly asserted that the army's only allegiance is to the constitution of India. 
not to any party, not to any politician, not to any official. Uh, this is different from his predecessor, General Bipin Rawat, who had faced political flack for criticizing student demonstrations against the government for a lack of leadership. Uh, Naravne, now this is important here, he wanted a change in the army's emphasis, operational emphasis. He felt that the Sino-Indian border was more important than the Indo-Pak border, whereas Rawat had retained pressure on the Pakistan border and on counterinsurgency, Naravne wanted it to be the pressure to be on Sino-Indian border. Now, as it turns out, Naravne was frightfully correct because while they were having this debate, uh, the, all these, these uh, sort of build-ups on the border and the, on the Chinese side were taking place. Now, Pakistan, meanwhile, and this is uh, stuff that is not usually known, uh, and uh, I'll pass it on to you because it was it was important. Uh, Pakistan had uh, reached out to General Rawat with a message, a personal message from General Kamar Javed Bajwa, who was the Army Chief of Pakistan. Bajwa wanted Rawat to give him time to get hold of the uh, sort of militant groups that were causing problems on the border uh, and to sort of rein in the Pakistan army and bring it on board the idea of peace or at least comparative peace with India. Uh, and just to illustrate what Javed uh, Bajwa was doing, he went on a visit to a Pakistani post near the line of action control. And uh, as is customary for the military, the post commander, who was a dashing young captain, uh, briefed him on, and the substance of the briefing was that we fired on the Indians at such and such time. We caused so many casualties on them. Uh, they are sort of, we are morally dominating them in our sector, and so on and so forth. So General Bajwa listened to all this, and then he tells the post commander, to aap, uh, Pakistan ka jhanda lal chok mein kab now this was a it was a cold water splash on his face because these are all tactical issues that were being discussed but the larger strategic issue which is relations between india and pakistan was not being issued at all and he was telling his army at that stage uh, that we need to think about these issues and at the larger sort of issue of peace between india and pakistan so uh, this was the message that was passed on to the Indian chief. But the Indian chief at that stage was uh, in the midst of uh, sort of stepping up his operational tempo and so on. He did not take action. And uh, the, the, the sort of situation continued to develop uh, in, a, in a sort of very negative manner for the Indian side. So uh, in the meanwhile, while China was preparing to uh, advance in on these five different points that we have uh, spoken about, uh, India's military was in its barracks. Now, why was the Indian military in its barracks? The answer is very simple, because it had been decided at a strategic level that the COVID-19 pandemic was the biggest threat that is being uh, sort of uh, faced by the Indian military at this point in time. We can't afford to let the military have large scale casualties to the pandemic. So we will not patrol, we will not go and uh, sort of check out the border. We will uh, confine the military to its barracks. We quickly built up forces uh, once the, the sort of uh, magnitude of, Park, of China's, uh, because China had, completely refused to take this pandemic uh, as a reason for, uh, uh, for, for stopping its operations on the border. They were continuing to come in and then suddenly the Indian chief realized that we have Chinese troops in our border and we need to take some action. So uh, the Indian side did not waste, the army may have made a mistake by, uh, by sort of not uh, being out ab initio, but it acted very quickly once the mistake was realized. 
the Indian army quickly built up forces to block any further Chinese advance. The Northern Command's reverse reserve division, as well as the second division, was moved quickly into Ladakh. Another division was moved into the central sector, that's the Uttarakhand uh, Tibet border, uh, where there had been only an infantry brigade so far. And uh, in sort of uh, in the analysis that immediately took place, there were three reasons that were believed to be essential for China to have acted as aggressively as they did. Uh, and these, these uh, reasons which the army arrived at independently uh, were all uh, substantiated later on in analysis that was took place. First, India's aggressive statements against China, which threatened to take back Aksai Chin from Calcutta. Uh, these were by the Home Minister in the House of Parliament, uh, where he said that Aksai Chin will come back to India, Pakistan occupied Kashmir will come back from India. Now, these, this was regarded as extremely provo uh, provocative and uh, uh, sort of cause for uh, China to take steps against India. The second uh, reason was India's unilateral move on 5th August uh, uh, 2019 to change this political status quo in Kashmir. Uh, you are all aware of that uh, Article 370 being nullified and so on. And the third reason that China sort of decided to take action was India's unilateral infrastructure building in the vicinity of the NAC. Uh, why do I say unilateral? I say it only because the Chinese use that phrase. Uh, in fact, the Chinese do seem to uh, have a rather sort of uh, uh, self-centered way of looking at infrastructure. They believe that it's okay for them to produce infrastructure and build roads and houses and so on, but it's not okay for India to do so. Uh, but India went ahead and started uh, building these roads and tracks in the vicinity of the uh, border, uh, as a result of which China felt provoked and uh, felt it essential to respond. Uh, so infrastructure building is China's strength more than India's. And even as this crisis was playing out, Chinese engineers were building high quality living shelters, weapons emplacements, roads and tracks, and even a bridge across the Pang uh, So on India's part, it had taken several firm steps too, and I should list them out. Uh, the Army and the ITBP stepped up joint exercises along the line of actual control. Uh, Indian engineers are building a road from the Nubra Valley to the Depsan Plain. This is an ex over extremely difficult terrain conditions, uh, but it would serve as a round the year alternative to the Darbuk Shok DBO road. That's the DS DBO road the road that goes from Pangong, so straight north up to Dalit Bay Goldie. So the, the uh, Nubra Valley, which is to the west of the DSDBO road, houses the Air Force Base, which now provides logistic support for the troops on the west, east, and Siachen. So in, uh, in a sort of major exercise of repositioning forces, the Indian side changed one plane strike bomb into a mountain strike core. This was to build up forces against Chinese or Pakistani moves along the LAC. Now, this is a huge step. And it's not just a huge step uh, in terms of the administrative uh, aspect of it. It's also a huge step in strategic signaling. What you're essentially saying is the message that is going out from India's military is, we are no longer going to be fixated on Pakistan. Uh, we have moved these forces from the Pakistan dossier to the Chinese dossier, and now we are going to focus on Pakistan. So there's an element of strategic signaling here, which is ex extremely important. Uh, also, the road network along the Kardongla Pass had been upgraded to give access to the Nubra Valley and a new access planned from a nearby area. So they were now building roads also. The Indian side was building these roads to lead to Dalat Bay Goldie and so on without having to cross in front of the Chinese positions along the LAC. So uh, finally, they also worked on infrastructure building from the capital Leh to Eastern Ladakh. 
to cut down on the driving time for military convoys. Now, uh, China, uh, look at the difference uh, in uh, sort of scale between China and India. What was China doing on its infrastructure at this time? It had listed 345 construction plans in a program aimed at building 461,000 kilometers of highway and motorway by 2035. We're talking about half a million kilometers of highway and motorway. Now, one of these highways known as G695 uh, is passing right from immediately north of the line of actual control uh, and therefore poses a, a threat to India in terms of the troops that can be routed through it. Uh, Lunze County, which according to some reports from China, uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being sarcastic here, Lunze County, which forms part of Arunachal Pradesh, which China claims is part of South Tibet, was also being connected by these roads. And finally, China is building a major highway along the LAC to strengthen its position and project its power, uh, which connects Lunze County in Tibet to Maza and Kashgar in Xinjiang region. That is literally thousands of kilometers across from the from the southern edge of China, southwestern edge to the central western edge. So what were the army's constraints in eastern Ladakh? Uh, this is a, sort of an important question because any sort of analyst would ask itself the question, why have we allowed ourselves to be caught in this pincer that the Chinese imposed on us? So, Let's let's take a look at some of these uh, aspects. And the first point I will bring out is that lay based 14 Corps is the army's only formation that has divided responsibilities. It faces Pakistan in the Kargil sector, the subsector north area, and Siachen, and then southwards from the Dalat Bay Gold Deeds, the same core faces China. So I mean. This is not a happy situation by any means. You don't want one core of yours to have to face two adversary countries uh, and deal with all the many different aspects that each of them do, does so differently. Uh, now, this gets even more worrisome because within 14 core, you have a division called three uh, infantry division, which has divided responsibility. It holds Siachen which is one of the most difficult battlegrounds in the world. Uh, and at the same time, it uh, sort of faces China in Eastern Ladakh. So at the time of the 2020 uh, intrusions, it had four brigades. I won't go into the numbers and so on, but 81 Mountain Brigade was responsible for subsector North, which is Dolat Bay Goldie. Uh, it had one brigade battalion physically deployed there, while the remaining two were at Darbuk, which is near Pangong. Uh, 70 Brigade was responsible from Demchok to Chuma. It's a heavy brigade, a four battalion brigade, but one of those battalions is always up deployed on the Siachen Glacier. And there is always another battalion that is training to relieve it because it requires two months of preparation to go up on Siachen. Uh, so the brigade essentially holds the line against China with one battalion with four companies forward. Now that is uh, definitely not enough to deal with a threat like China. Uh, Three Dev also has an integral mechanized battalion, two armored regiments. The, the Indians had fortunately, before the start of this thing, moved up two armored brigades into a Ladakh. Uh, and were it not for that, we don't know whether we'd have been able to sort of deal with the situation or not. Uh, also part participating in the defense of the area were five Ladakh scouts battalions. These are local troops from uh, local Ladakhis, extremely sort of well acclimatized, extremely tough, and uh, thank heavens that they were there. Uh, then we come to the Siachen commitment. Uh, it was sort of the best way uh, that I believe is to hold the glacier by giving the battalions one year, 10 years. Already there's an introduced a cycle of eight months in the northern glacier 
and 10 months in the central glacier. But you need to have people spending more time there so that so much time is not wasted in the induction, de-induction, acclimatization phase. Uh, another way is to raise more Ladakh scout battalions uh, or Vikas battalions. Vikas battalions, uh, for those who don't know, are recruited from the Tibetan refugee community in India. And there's a proposal to raise 12 battalions of Ladakh scouts and have six battalions up on the glacier and six down below. But, uh, and here's, uh, here I will make a provocative point. Uh, for the Indian army, there is this whole Siachen culture uh, where, you know, you go there, you get a medal ribbon, you get decorated for uh, gallantry for, for sort of the very difficult conditions that they work in there. You get extra pay and allowances and so on. So there's this Siachen service culture that the army wants to retain. And the result is that there is too much time spent on this coming and going. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the first of the uh, sort of uh, uh, areas that came under threat and which uh, sort of uh, is uh, one of the most important in, the, in that particular area. That is the Galwan Valley. Now, the most worrying situation, as I brought out, was that the PLA had crossed China's own claim line and breached several kilometers into Indian territory. Uh, this took place on May 5th, and it signaled the start of active hostilities. This was followed in short order by China's second intrusion, which took place in Nakula, in Sikkim, uh, and also a second settled border. The Sikkim border, remember, is the only part of the, Indo uh, the Sino Indian frontier, the LAC and the McMahon line. Sikkim is the only part that has a settled border on which China and India agree. Because this is because of the historical sort of relationship between uh, Sikkim and China. The third intrusion which took place near Pangong Lake uh, was on the 12th and the 13th of March of uh, May, uh, where again a couple of thousand Chinese soldiers occupied territory. So, uh, what uh, was the sort of position of China on the Galwan River Valley? Because so far, its position has been uh, that it is a settled frontier. But at the same time, it's always been one of the biggest battlegrounds between India and China. Uh, a China defense website with close links to the PLA uh, claimed this time that the Galwan River Valley is a part of China. This was the first time that they had actually uh, made an official claim to this event. Uh, he stated that the Indian side crossed the line in the Galwan Valley and unilaterally changed the status of the, of the border. Uh, the Galwan Valley is Chinese ter territory and the local control situation is very poor. Now, in one respect, this follows a previous pattern. In Starting from 1956, China had systematically eroded Galwan's status. Uh, it made an official claim in 1960, and then it acted to capture Galwan in uh, military action during the 1962 war. Uh, in 1960, when Chao Enlai led an official delegation for talks to New Delhi, China advanced uh, a new border that claimed an additional 5,180 square kilometers of Indian territory in Ladakh. Uh, now running generally west of the 1956 claim line, it ran close to the east bank of the Shiok River, cutting the Galwan River close to its confluence with the Shiok, which was west of the earlier claim. Uh, further south, it claimed more of the Pangong Lake, all of the Spangur Lake, and then ran approximately along the 1956 claim line to Demcho. Now, During the 62 war, Chinese troops captured the Galwan Valley post, killing 36 Indian soldiers. After the war, China advanced its claim line even further west and claimed an additional 2,000 square kilometers of Ladakh. Now, uh, with these latest uh, incursions, even this claim line has been violated and China is attempting to push the, the frontier at Galwan further west. 
So let's uh, sort of having taken a look at the current situation, uh, the positions that exist as a consequence of China's latest incursions, uh, let's just go back to uh, the post-1962 war and see how we came from that 62 post-62 situation up to where we are today. Now, after the 62 war, India was, and the Indian military was so uh, sort of operationally uh, traumatized that we decided not to hold the frontier close to the line of action control uh, or close to the McMahon line, uh, but to pull back significantly so that there's a large void between the border and the Indian positions. Uh, and so that there was not, uh, you know, any accidental hostilities that were set off. Uh, the, the simple fact of the matter is, and we have to admit it, uh, we were traumatized by the 1962 defeat. Uh, it took a full 21 years uh, until about 1983 uh, before General Krishna Rao, uh, who was the army chief at that time, he spoke to Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and said, we cannot continue to be this far from the border. We have to move up. We have to hold the border in strength. And if the Chinese take any action, we will just have to deal with it. So uh, in 83 or thereabouts, uh, Indira Gandhi gave uh, the permission for a return to the borders and the setting up of what they called a forward policy. Uh, the uh, a group of uh, sort of China experts called the China Study Group uh, examined this, uh, found it okay, laid down a sequence of patrolling points uh, all along the border where Indian patrols would go up, reach the patrolling point, show their presence over there to the Chinese, and then come back. Uh, this was uh, to, to sort of reassert India's ownership of its own territory. Uh, and you, know, uh, you would imagine that the Chinese would not take kindly to this, and you would be correct. Because this, while this happened around 83, 84, uh, by 1986, the Chinese took objection to an Indian patrol going to uh, a place north of Tawang called Sundarongchu. And uh, there was a big standoff and the Chinese refused. They, they entered Indian territory, occupied Indian territory and said, uh, you know, you have started this game now uh, and we will continue it. So the Indians actually held fast over there. They, they, that's a whole different story by itself, but uh, there was very good soldiering at that stage by the Indian army uh, and they held on to their positions. And this led to uh, sort of a lot of negotiations and border talks, but it led more importantly to Rajiv Gandhi's visit to Beijing in 1988 and his meeting with Deng Xiaoping. Uh, that led to a very uh, seminal agreement called the Border Peace and Tranquility Agreement of 1993. Uh, that essentially laid down uh, sort of ways of operating and methods of operating and intentions and sort of uh, a lack of hostility uh, that would ensure that this patrolling which took place by both sides did not lead to a clash and did not lead to any fighting. So uh, the Border Peace and Tranquility Agreement uh, led on to five treaties that actually kept the peace. One was in 1996, confidence building measures, and then 2005, 2012, and 2013. Uh, and uh, in addition to all of that, the Special Representatives Dialogue was introduced uh, and uh, there was sort of, a, sort of a continuous exchange of views and an exchange of uh, methodology that kept the peace, even while discussing the border tension. Uh, the Special Representatives Dialogue actually yielded in 2005 uh, in a very important sort of agreement uh, that uh, we hoped would set the stage for further agreements between India and China on the border. 
but has not actually done so. So uh, before I finish, let me sort of uh, ask the question, where is the border? We are having so much of uh, discussion and so much of uh, sort of confrontation with China over the border. The fact is Beijing has never divulged where it believes that the LAC runs. The LAC is of course the line of action control. Uh, and it did little to sort of remedy that when it told an Indian newspaper in Beijing in September 2020, when this uh, sort of situation was brewing up, that the Sound Sino Indian border clearly followed the LAC as it stood on November 7, 1959. Now, what was the significance of this 1959 border? China has never uh, sort of divulged the LAC, as I said with clear map coordinates, it prefers to keep New Delhi off balance and guessing while retaining for itself the position of uh, sort of constantly changing facts on the ground. Uh, this has been the case since 19th century when Britain's multiple proposals for settling a border uh, and also the settling of the McMahon line that was drawn up in 1914 Shimla conference uh, None of these were taken heed of by China. It just maintained a stony silence and said uh, probably amongst themselves that let the situation become more propitious and then we will settle a border on our terms. Now, only in 1956 did China, which was now an assertive power that had battled the United States to a draw in Korea, uh, only in 1956 did China produce its first map. Now, this depicted the Aksai chain in China uh, with the boundary running along the Karakoram range, uh, sorry, along the Kunlun range. Even so, the 1956 alignment left to India the Depsang Plain, the valleys of the Chipchap River, Karakash and Galwan River, the hot springs area, most of the Pangong Lake and a part of the Spangur Lake. Now, Chinese Premier Chao Enlai affirmed this boundary in 1959 in a letter to Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, in which for the first time reference was made to a line of action control, NAC. In the 1960 officials dialogue, the Chinese delegation presented a new version of the boundary that shifted the 1956 line substantially westwards. In explaining this, the Chinese said the 1960 line was an updated and more accurate version of the 1956 line. You can you so can sort of uh, get a sense of what it must be like dealing with the Chinese. Uh, the 1960 line claimed much of Depsang, Karakash, Galwan River Valley, and all of the Spangur Lake. Uh, and at Pangong Lake, the boundary ran through uh, Finger 8, which was Sirija. Uh, you must have heard about these fingers and read about them while this uh, sort of uh, the, the confrontation was going on in 2020. Uh, with the Chinese capturing chunks of Indian territory in the 1962 war, the LAC moved westwards yet again. Uh, at the end of the war, the PLA undertook to withdraw 20 kilometers from where it had advanced to, but its withdrawal was selective. Naturally, all winners sort of, of uh, wars choose the peace treaty and the, the, the terminology and uh, sort of uh, terms uh, which suit them. Uh, compared to pre-war positions, China occupied an additional 3,500 square kilometers of Indian territory. Uh, however, in several places, China withdrew from areas it had claimed in 1960, including, and this is very important, Depsang and the Galwan River Valley. The Indian Army gradually reoccupied these areas, setting up pickets in some places, while in others designating patrolling points that our troops would periodically visit to assert our claim. Now, by attempting to deny India these same areas, that is Depsang, Galwan River Valley, much of the Pangongso, uh, China appears to be reasserting the 1960 line, signaling that any Indian presence beyond that constitutes a violation. Uh, however, it seems contradictory for Beijing to invoke the November 1969 LAC after they themselves have transgressed that line at multiple points this year. 
So former foreign ministry officials recount that in 83, 84, uh, the two sides were discussing a possible East for West boundary settlement that involved India handing over the Aksai chain, most of the Western sector in return for China, ceding Arunachal Pradesh to India. Uh, at that time, the army had provided our foreign ministry negotiators maps marked with our interpretation of the LAC, uh, which also showed the additional territory occupied by China in the 1962 operations. The Indian side had informally proposed an LAC plus solution, which involved China returning the territory occupied in 1962 uh, in order to please to sweeten the East for West package proposal. Uh, till today, Beijing does not formally accept any difference between the post-62 line and the November 1959 line. However, the negotiators point out that it tacitly did accept the difference in 1983-84, just by their willingness to even consider the LAC plus solution. So all of this became jarringly apparent in 1993 uh, while negotiating the Border Peace and Tranquility Agreement. Uh, the Chinese sort of, however, continue stalling this and multiple versions of the NAC continue to exist. Uh, let me just see how much time we have. It's quarter to four, so I will not diverge uh, into any other areas that we haven't done. Uh, uh, Alka, I'll, I'll sort of hand it over to you back for the question and answers and so on. And uh, uh, I, I think I've done what I had to say. Uh, thanks, Sajay. Um, well, you've done uh, what needed to be done in the sense that once again we are we, we we you brought us to the precipice of that ever you know ever uh, agonizing issue that really what exactly is it going to take to 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 resolve this and uh, the narrative that you have brought of course the unfortunate events uh, in 2020 has once again brought out the fact that it's been a long saga of just very little convergence or meeting of, of minds on how we should draw this line. Uh, even if one were to take the view that the Manmohan Singh government had done, that let's come to some kind of an understanding and forget about it. Even that now does not seem to be, uh, be the case. I mean, it's, it's just not possible to have some kind of an understanding which would be agreeable to both. And uh, the last three years have, have made that amply clear. So yes, I think we are once again, we be, we were back really in that uh, unfortunate position of uh, seeing a rather long uncertain phase ahead. And given the political uh, temperatures uh, that are currently operating, it doesn't seem as if there is going to be any likelihood of uh, uh, normalcy in, in, in other matters as well in the relationship. It, it all seems to now be hinging on a somehow coming to a way beyond Galvan before we can think of other things. And that, to my mind, is, is a bit of an unfortunate uh, uh, development of this. So anyway, we open it up now. Um, Rashmi, you can take us uh, through the questions. I already see uh, Ambassador Ashokant has. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we can start with let uh, Ashok, if you would like, just ask your question, unmute yourself, and. Can, can you hear me? Yes, please go. Yes. Ahead. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, thanks, Ajay, for that. Uh, you know, very comprehensive and insightful presentation. Uh, you know, there are so many issues to discuss, but uh, you know, let me, you know, confine myself to, to you know, a uh, uh, couple of issues. Uh, one, uh, you know, in terms, I entirely agree with you that uh, what has happened since April, May 2020 is very different from uh, kind of transgressions we had seen uh, across India and LAC in the past uh, 
फर्स्ट पॉइंट क्वेश्चन है वट काइंड ऑफ चेंज दीज ट्रांसग्रेशन हैमाउंटेड टू इन टर्म्स ऑफ टेरिटरी कंट्रोल्ड पेट्रोल बाय टू साइड्स because as you know there are very different narratives on this issue we would like to have your understanding of that and also a link question uh, whether uh, depsan plains and demchok can be seen as legacy issues as some people have argued uh, that's my first question uh, my second question is uh, you know since uh, june 2020 uh we have managed to bring about uh, some uh, uh, disengagement at so called uh, friction points so uh, uh, what do you think about the nature of this engagement uh you know how does it uh, impact uh, uh our position on the ground because you are quite familiar with uh, with the position on the ground uh, third question is uh, you know uh, looking ahead uh, uh what kind of solution you uh will you advocate i'm not i'm not saying what will happen uh will it involve you know uh, more of uh, what we have achieved so in terms of uh, of so called buffer zones or should be something uh, different uh, uh do you expect uh, uh, any kind of return to status quo ante or that's uh, uh no longer feasible uh sh alka shall i go ahead yes please uh okay first of all uh, it's a great honor to be uh, sort of uh, addressing to an uh, audience with uh, ambassador kantanet given that he has many of the sort of policies that we spoke about uh, and many of the sort of uh, engagements that we have carried out with uh, china in the last 70 75 years uh, he has had a, a sort of a role in formulating them so to that extent thank you sir and uh, uh, let me sort of ask answer your questions uh, the legacy issue argument of uh, demchok and uh, and depsan being sort of somehow exempt from uh, the other sort of aspects of the of any agreement or any sort of uh sort of uh, solution that we negotiate with the chinese uh it sounds to me a bit like uh, sort of an excuse for giving up what is rightly ours uh i think that if we start by accepting the need for uh, legacy issues to be treated differently uh we will sort of uh, we will have conceded at least some uh part of our sort of uh, rightfully held territory uh, and uh, sort of uh, said uh, in in sort of in tacit ways to the chinese that okay we'll give you the, this much of area uh, in exchange for uh, a solution coming through now uh, if these were regular areas that uh, that uh, sort of we could afford to let go of uh it would still be worth considering in order to reach a settlement uh but uh, depsang as you know is is uh, sort of it's an important area it is held by us uh, as the northern sort of bookend of our entire defenses the northern hinge of the indian defenses and it provides uh, access and entry routes to the chinese to enter other important areas such as siachen and so on so while i would uh, sort of uh, support a, a, a sort of a solution that uh, gives away uh, in, even the word calls uh, it gives away a part of uh, demchok uh, i think that depsang is an is a sort of extremely important area uh, the dolak beg oldi sector the sub sector north and so on these have legacy issues uh, both for india and for china but we have to be clear that there are areas that we will concede and there are areas that we absolutely will not concede 
we have uh, sort of we would have already uh, taken into account China's feelings and emotions and uh, tactical and strategic sort of uh, imperatives in conceding Aksai Chin because G219 uh, is a sort of highway that they have made much about. So we can concede them that. But uh, to sort of take that forward into uh, the area across uh, what would be Indian territory, uh, I would say uh, we need to sort of be a little cautious about that. Uh, then uh, the second issue uh, you had mentioned was, could, could uh, Radhika? Could yeah, you know, I, I talked about, you know, uh, the way disengagement has been carried out there, you know, the, along the fiction points, uh, uh, whether in Galvan Valley or northern and southern banks of uh, uh, Pankung or, you know, uh, in Hot Spring, uh, Gogra area, you know, partial disengagement. Uh, uh, what is your uh, you know, uh, right? Is, is that something which can become a, a, a long term uh, LAC or is it something uh, we should look at temporary expedient and find uh, a different kind of solution? And also, you know, the, my first question I included, uh, do you see a significant change in terms of the uh, situation on the ground uh, as a result of these right. Chinese incursions right. and, you know, disengagement which has been uh, carried out so far? Right. Uh, the, the aspect of uh, sort of... Uh, acceptability of the sort of withdrawals and disengagements that have taken place uh, is uh, sort of, it's an extremely important uh, point. Uh, but I think it, this is, uh, it's a position of bargaining advantage that China seeks at this point in time. Uh, the, the sort of uh, the withdrawals and disengagements that have taken place are subject to further sort of discussion and further negotiation uh, in some places at least. Uh, and the Chinese knowing their, their uh, sort of their legendary skills, I mean, this is, I'm going back thousands of years, uh, their legendary skills at negotiation and at bargaining, uh, they would certainly try and extract more from uh, the, the positions that they have reached right now uh, for example, if Galwan is uh, is uh, sort of uh, has been settled at PP14, uh, which it has almost right now, uh, I think that if we come on to the negotiating table and we tell the Chinese that uh, you know we would require access to PP12 and PP11, uh, they would straight away uh, reopen the 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 sort of uh, uh, the, the agreements that they have already made and try and bring concessions to the table on those as well. So the Chinese are very good, very skilled at negotiating. Uh, and, uh, you know, who knows better than you, you must have done some uh, fairly tough negotiations with them. Uh, so, the, you know, that uh, will have to be taken into account. No concessions unilaterally because uh, we, I think, uh, we, we tend to be too generous in our negotiations. If we start making concessions as a start point, we will lose out on uh, sort of things that Chinese will demand. Uh, and the third point that you made, the, the third question, uh, related to uh, the effect of what has happened on the Indian Army uh, on the ground. Uh, the Indian Army uh, has with some difficulty uh, overcome the, the sort of the effects and the sort of trauma of the 1962 war. And uh, when you have a legacy of that nature, uh, my belief is that when you have another traumatic experience coming on top of that, and the experience at Galwan was extremely traumatic, uh, especially for, uh, in the way that the injured were treated and the way that uh, uh, sort of uh, mistreatment was accorded to our soldiers, uh, there was a clear attempt, and I've uh, spoken to some of the people involved, there was a clear attempt to impose psychological sort of uh, superiority 
over the over our soldiers uh, by mistreating them and deliberately mishandling them. So the Chinese are, are, are some pretty good at psychological warfare, and there was clearly an attempt to impose psychological dominance over the Indians on this. Uh, that having been said, uh, the Indian Army is a is a good army. It's uh, it's capable of uh, absorbing defeat. It's capable of coming out of defeat, and it's capable of leading on to victory as well. Uh, I think that there will there will be a residual effect of what has happened on the Indian Army, but I think that uh, you know with good leadership and uh, sort of uh, clear direction. Uh, we would be able to come out of this without long-term damage. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, thank Kalia. you, Ajay. <clears throat> yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, uh, sir, the next question is from Minakshi Menon. She says, it appears that the executive has not voiced thank any you, public... Radhika, uh... There is sure, a chat box. If we go, the second question is by Ambassador Ide. Uh, and then, of course, uh, because Ambassador Kanta had raised this hand, I had asked him to come in first because, as, a show, as, as uh, Ajay has very rightly pointed out, here is uh, one of our star negotiators. So he had opened the questions. But I think we <laughs> go to we'll go to Ambassador Ide first, and then go down the chat. Uh, whoever is there. Sure, sure ma'am. Sure, yeah. ma'am. Uh, shall I read out the question? Yes, yes, yes. According to the news report, Mangi wanted to discuss the status of Tawang in December 2019 during this 22nd session of Special Representative Dialogue. Do you think that Chinese are really serious to get Tawang? Since then, I do not hear much about, the, much about this Special Representative Dialogue, how the work of this dialogue might come back to constructive path to solve border issues. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I I think that that's that's a sort of uh, question that holds great relevance and importance for us. Uh, the Chinese have, in my opinion, they made that concession uh, of uh, in the in the special representatives dialogue of saying that the interests of settled populations and they were clearly talking about the one. Uh, would be taken into account in any settlement. Uh, this is uh, the political parameters question. Uh, now, I don't think the Chinese will allow themselves, having made a concession, uh, to be held to that concession and to be uh, sort of forced to make additional demands, uh, you know, that, that may be going beyond that uh, thing. I think that they made that concession at a particular point in time, this is year 2005, when India and uh, the United States were coming together uh, sort of in a sort of in a very rapid manner, when uh, the two countries, India and the United States, had signed an agreement for the military, what was called the military framework agreement, which was would bring them together as military partners. And the Chinese felt that they had to make a concession in order to throw uh, India away from the United States at that point in time. So they, they did so uh, full well, I, I, I suspect, full well knowing that they would be able to back off from it later because of the ambiguity of the statement itself, that the interests of the settled populations <coughs> would be kept in mind. They could very well take a uh, turnaround and say, and argue that the interests of the settled populations are much better uh, advanced with the Chinese rather than with the Indians. And therefore, interests of the settled populations could mean that it comes on to the Chinese side of the kitty rather than the Indian side. I'm just giving a, a, a random example. Uh, so I think that uh, we would still need to continue negotiating in an extremely tough manner. Uh, we need to deploy all the other weapons that we have at our disposal, our friendships and partnerships with other countries, 
uh, our sort of uh, control over the uh, Indian Ocean sea lanes. Uh, these are all things that go into a larger negotiation between two great powers. And I would sort of uh, put India in that category as well. Uh, so I think that, yeah, it was a concession, but it was a withdrawable concession. And we'll, we should not be over sort of optimistic that the Chinese will deliver on any of that. It's rather interesting uh, what you say, Ajay, because uh, I agree that, you know, that concession which raised so much of hope within India that you know, this, this appeared to be the foundation of, of an agreement. And yet, uh, amazingly, nothing came out of it. It fizzled. And uh, we've done, uh, you know, enough uh, study of this. And we see that there was a tremendous reaction within China against this particular uh, uh, even within the PLA, within the party and among the people. And so I think the Chinese decided to just sort of step back. And and you're right. I mean, <laughs> they could easily turn it around and say, well, we'll protect the interests better. So yeah, uh, the, the, the bizarre thing is that 2003, which appeared to be a concretization of two decades of efforts, uh, just doesn't... Uh, this doesn't produce anything tangible. Uh, no, uh, you know, Ajay, just a factual thing <laughs> to point out, uh, since I happen to be a negotiator for that agreement, uh, it says that each side will protect, safeguard, due interest of its settled population. So it's for us to settle, safeguard, due interest of our population. It's not, you know, so formulation is very clear there. Any case, this is something we can discuss later. Yes. I, this is very, uh, very fascinating. I mean, and a lovely point to quibble on, but we can take this up later. Uh, <laughs> we'll have Prabhat Kumar now, and then Ambassador Goyal and Amit Dogra who put up their hands and then come to Rohil. And I think we'll have to stop there. Um, isn't it, Rashmi? We'll be running out of time. So you can read out Prabhat Kumar's... Uh... Uh, sure, ma'am. We keep talking about agreements to maintain peace on the border. Don't you think, sir, that this is putting that cart before the horse without first clearly knowing where exactly the border is? How can one ensure peace and tranquility over it? Uh, okay. Uh, that, that's a sort of, again, a cart before the horse <laughs> argument, typical one. Uh, and one that uh, the Chinese, I'm sure, will uh, deploy at some stage or the other. But the fact of the matter is that uh, you do not have to uh, know where the border is in order to uh, sort of uh, agree to uh, act in a particular manner in order to prevent violence or bloodshed on that border. Uh, when you think of it in very practical terms, it's uh, you know, it governs the actions of uh, patrols on the ground, of troops on the ground, of formed military units on the ground. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you have to lay down how a Chinese sort of platoon will behave with an Indian platoon, uh, am I, am I uh, sort of audible? Yes, you were audible. Please go yes, ahead. Yes, okay. you were audible. Okay, okay. Sorry, it's uh, gone off on my side, the, the video. So I'll continue since I'm audible. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, if you lay down a sort of a code of conduct, uh, sort of set of things that can be carried and not carried in terms of weaponry uh, and so on and so forth, uh, there is, there is uh, sort of a, 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 an effect that it is likely to have on the behavior of the troops con uh, concerned uh, when they are constantly served a reminder of uh, what they can do and what they cannot do. Uh, of course, there you're, you're right in that there is always some maverick who's uh, out to make a name for himself, uh, but uh, that should be the exception rather than the rule. It's good to have some rules in place. Indeed, and I think since we have just uh, um spoken about the importance of words and phrases, um, it's important to bear in mind that that agreement speaks of maintenance of peace and security of the border regions. 
So we are not really talking about a settled border, but in the regions, and that's where what Ajay has said kicks in, that you have a code. You have ways of proceeding in case of encounters. You have ways of communicating when there are possible disagreements. So it's about a larger kind of a framework within which you would like to keep that, that, that peace so that uh, it does not upset the atmosphere for the negotiations that are going on. Uh, Ambassador Goyal, would you come in now? Thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much, Akhanda Chukla. Mine is a question slightly based on the history of our negotiations on the border. You have explained the past situation and the current situation has done very well. Having worked uh, on the issue, though not in the same position as Ambassador uh, Ashok Kanta, but I was working on China also for a long time. The point really here is that even from 1978 onwards, the kind of an idea of settling the border on the uh, basis of, uh, you know, status quo is kind of a position with minor give and take has been there for a long time. There is a full record of negotiations in 1958, everything. Every time you come to a, some kind of an understanding that we are close to a settlement, the Chinese come up, you yourself said it, come up with the new ideas, the new suggestions, and then we restart the negotiations again. So my first really, is a, is a puzzle actually, whether the way to relations with China actually lies in the border or, that, or is, there, is that something else? Because once there is a bill on the other side also to actually settle the border, I don't really see any great problem there. With some give and take, it can be done, but they change the positions. Combined with that is almost an insistence. And that happened in 1988 when the, uh, Rajiv Gandhi came as the prime minister to Beijing, uh, agreement, et cetera, the peace and uh, tranquility agreement. At every moment, there is a practical insistence from China that we should leave the boundary issue uh, aside and focus on the other issues, as if they actually do not want to settle the issue for the time being. So my question to you is, what is your understanding of the Chinese approach on settling the border issue, but if there is any inclination? Right. Uh, I think, uh, Ajay, we'll just take in Ahmed Dokra's also point. You can take both of them together, and then we'll conclude with Bodhi. Yeah. Yes, Ahmed, go on. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, sir, for such an insightful session and uh, my question is regarding the border infrastructure so as we have seen uh, in the northeastern region china has come up with this shokang village policy and they are effectively using civil and military infrastructure so for the border dominance and relocating mainland uh, citizens in uh, in the border regions and also we see that uh, this uh, this is extending towards uh, chumbi valley and towards more regions in uttarakhand also so uh, when uh, this thing, uh, Shokan policy will uh, reach uh, no, uh, up na, uh, Ladakh region. So there, we have been stopping our side, uh, nomads on our side to access the borders. And, but on their side, the, they have been effectively supported by the PLA to exert uh, more, uh, to occupy more land. So what, what does stop, uh, what, what stops us from doing, uh, using our nomads as a leverage uh, to, uh, to maintain the border status? Right. Alka, should we answer yeah. that? Yeah, both of them, please. Ambassador. Okay. okay. Uh, the first uh, question first, uh, and that is that uh, what is it that uh, the Chinese uh, sort of really want? Was that the sum and substance of the thing? What is it that the Chinese are looking for in the negotiation? Absolutely, yes. Uh, but uh, it, some minor nuances in the sense that it is not just the border. Maybe border is part of it. Okay. But what should be the approach to the negotiations? Okay. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, bring to the negotiating table, at least from what I have spoken to Chinese academics and military officers and so on, uh, and they seem to be of the opinion 
that uh, they would like uh, a settlement with India, but it would not be a settlement or a settlement would not be acceptable were it to be uh, sort of uh, because of US pressure or because India managed to get one over the Chinese uh, by making friends with the United States and therefore bringing a certain degree of leverage and pressure onto uh, the, the Chinese to settle with the Indians. Uh, a lot of these people who I'm referring to uh, seem to believe that uh, as of now, India is relying too much on its United States partnership, uh, which will not, which or which should not give it uh, uh, sort of dividends, because otherwise that will be seen as a loss for China. So uh, whether this is true or not, whether this is what actually plays out or not, the Chinese seem to believe that, uh, you know, uh, it would be a, a sort of a blow to their great power ambitions and to the way that uh, they present themselves in the global commodity uh, community if they were to uh, succumb to pressure in these negotiations from the United States. Uh, on the, uh, the second question, uh, which was, again, I'm, I'm getting completely tangled up in the questions. Uh, what what, what is about, the question? It's about using state power to use nomads. Okay, it's state power to use. Right. That, that was a great investigation by Human Rights Watch. Uh, and uh, it, it is uh, sort of, uh, it is of immediate relevance to us because it happened right on our border and it happened on the border where we should be one up on uh, sort of the use of nomads. Now, first of all, it, I would I would sort of just point out to you that uh, it's a different situation in Ladakh and a different situation in Arunachal Pradesh, where nomads are uh, sort of a genuine weapon in the second category. But in the Ladakh area, the Aksai Chin area, there is so little settled population and so few uh, nomadic graziers that venture out over there that there is a severe limit to how much pressure they can put on uh, the thing. Uh, the other major difference is that uh, in the case of the Chinese side, they have alienated the local population to such a degree uh, that they need to sort of uh, make, uh, make sort of overtures to them, uh, to give them incentives and so on. Uh, even if there was no India in the case, in the picture at all. Whereas India has, uh, while not sort of doing it to the extent that is possible within our resources and within our means, uh, we have maintained some form of a relationship with the graziers. Uh, and uh, sort of that relationship plays out every year in, when the graziers take their flocks for for grazing in the high altitude border pastures. So I think that uh, the Indian side has uh, advantages to reap over here. Uh, they are not doing it to the extent that they need to do it. But uh, on the Chinese side, they are in a sort of in a in a sort of much more unfavorable situation. And I sort of deliberately use that much uh, for the simple reason that they have so damaged their relations with the local uh, Tibetan graziers that, uh, you know, I'm sure the graziers would be uh, getting uh, sort of incentives from the Chinese, but at the same time, not being grateful or patriotic about it, but seeing it as something that they wrested from the Chinese uh, and uh, in order to uh, do a sort of a, a task that they would uh, that they actually pay a very heavy price to. All right, thanks. Uh, so shall we end with Rohil's question because we are running, reaching the end of our time. Uh, Rohil, I think you can uh, unmute and ask your question and then we can take it to conclusion. Um, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation, sir. It was 
Oh, just a second. There's somebody, somebody don't speak up. I've I've lost your voice. Yeah, yeah, we're just sorting out something because we're all sitting in a room and someone's on speaker. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation, sir. Um, my question was, are we seeing a new status quo develop? Uh, because uh, as like, are we seeing the effective boundaries of East Ladakh shifting due to Chinese activity and presence? Given that, at least uh, from what I know, the government's, the Indian government's stance is still fairly unclear. What does the medium term future look like? Are we seeing some form of new uh, settlement or a tacit settlement developing, or should we expect pushback to status quo ante uh, in the near future? Yeah, that's a very uh, good and a very important question at this point in time. Uh, my own personal read is that we uh, are seeing a new status quo developing. Uh, we have uh, sort of lost some territories already, but uh, the loss is not just in territorial terms. Uh, the loss is in psychological dominance. The loss is in uh, sort of the ability and willingness to work together towards a, a sort of mutually beneficial solution. Uh, I think uh, the Chinese have uh, sort of made uh, some mistakes not dissimilar to what they made in 1962, which is that they relied too much on the use of force. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, there are certain sort of uh, drawbacks in what they gained. Uh, and uh, that that is something that they will uh, sort of, that they will uh, put on the minor side when they tot up their strategic, uh, you know, wins and loses. Uh, then on the Ladakh side, I mean, uh, the calculations are uh, different for different people, but I have heard calculations ranging from uh, the loss of 1,000 square kilometers of Indian territory to as much as 2,500. Of course, it all depends on how you calculate the loss and where you draw the lines and so on. Uh, but that is a significant loss of territory. Uh, and that is something that uh, India cannot sort of just ignore and uh, sort of uh, be behave as if it's not happened. So there will be a price that uh, China will pay. That price is imposed on India, but in India will have to inflict it. Uh, and to that extent, yeah, there's a new status quo. Uh, India will try to, to sort of uh, negate that, but uh, you know how far it gets, I don't know. Thank you, thank you. Alka ma'am, we've missed a few questions by Minakshi and Ashish Chabla on the YouTube platform. Shall we take them? Of course. Uh, okay. Uh, question by Minakshi says It appears that the executive has not voiced any public concern on the incursions. Will the army take a more public position? Should they? Who protects the sovereignty of our land and our people? You know, I got a sort of ringtone in my ears when you were saying that. Could you please repeat that? Sure, so I can repeat it. Uh, she says that it appears that the executive has not voiced any public concerns and on the incursions. Will the army take a more public position? Should they? Who protects the sovereignty of our land and our people? Yeah, that's a very uh, important question and a very difficult one to answer. Uh, but, you know, I, I sort of made the point in my sort of presentation that, uh, you know, the, 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 the point that, uh, how, how should I put it? Uh, that, uh, you know, the government of uh, India and the government of China uh, and their sort of official mechanisms found themselves on the same side of the argument. Uh, the government of India was saying no. There was no. There have been no Chinese incursions. Uh, there had been no territory lost to the Chinese. And the Chinese side, when it was being sort of asked when they will withdraw or uh, sort of how they will get their troops out of uh, a particular area in the senior officers' negotiations, 
They were saying, what area? Your own government is turning around and saying that there is no Chinese in the in, in, in Indian territory. So uh, there is a, sort of a, a complete dichotomy over there. And it's a dichotomy that doesn't make us look good as a, as a state, a responsible state that uh, looks after its own territory and that ensures that it's safeguarded and bargained for and brought back if it's lost. So yeah, that's that. That's where we stand right now. We, we are in a in a sort of extremely awkward position, and the government uh, sort of, for some political reason, uh, plays this as uh, a sort of a political game rather than a serious sort of strategic uh, loss. Yeah, Radhika is there. Mm -hmm. No, ma'am, no more questions. No, no, ma'am, no more questions. I would like to seek the chair's permission to end this session. Yeah, just give me, I'm thinking, let me just uh, give my some concluding points and then we can. Sure, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Ajay. I think uh, while you rightly say that the politics of it is becoming much more. Uh, dominant than the concerns, uh, strategic concerns. Uh, on the other hand, we are also seeing that um, Indian foreign policy is now uh, turning towards uh, a very different kind of an approach to deal with the Chinese issue. And so there are now uh, serious uh, strategic rethinking about how we have to place our relationships, particularly with the West, in the context of uh, deteriorating with their China. So I think the ramifications of this are not going to be just about the balance on the border or the claims, counterclaims, and a whole host of other issues. Um, in history, I think, uh, particularly since nation states came into being, these have been just about the most emotive kind of issues. I don't think uh, we are going to see the end of this very soon. Um, scholars at the ICS have long been talking about how civilizational states like India and China need to take a very different approach to the idea of boundaries, um, which is not completely dominated by the compulsions of the nation state framework. And um, even that does not seem to be something within our grasp at the moment. Um, we seem to be we seem to be poised in a very very delicate a very I think disturbing uh, fashion uh, because it is uh, putting on hold a whole range of exchanges, um, interactions, discussions, which is the vital need of the hour. I mean, when we should be talking most, uh, we are really, uh, we are really choking off conversation. So that's that's really my concern. And by way of conclusion, I just about a few couple of hours back, I heard about one of my favorite, uh, favorite novelists, um, among my favorite novelists, Milan Kundera, uh, has just uh, you know, passed away, which is a bit Ooh. sad for me. Yeah, I, I, really, uh, I, I really am a great fan of his writing. I'm just going to conclude with one little quotation, which I have in my you know, quotation bag um, from Kundera. And it sort of seems to me kind of apt kind of uh, epitaph here. Uh, this was his uh, work, uh, Insignificance, in which he says, we've known for a long time that it was no longer possible to overturn this world, nor reshape it, nor head off its dangerous headlong rush. There's been only one possible resistance, not to take it seriously. <laughs> but uh, I think we can't say that we can not take it seriously. Uh, it is a serious matter. I hope this is going to be the start of a series of conversations on the border. Uh, I think we need to, uh, amongst ourselves, uh, trash out this issue more and see what, what are the suggestions, what are the possibilities. Uh, every situation has possibilities. And so I conclude with heartfelt thanks to Ajay for this. Uh, Thank for this you very much. Interesting conversation. Thank you. Um, Radhika, over to you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. With this, we wrap the session and we thank our speakers for giving us their precious time. The video of today's discussion will be available on ICS YouTube 
platform, we at ICS conduct seminar every Wednesday. The title for the next Wednesday seminar is Corporate, Compete, Challenge, Compromise and Convince a U.S. Policy Towards China. And the speaker is Dr. Amit Gupta. Information related to the same will be available on the ICS website or you could also subscribe to our newsletter for regular updates. Thank